from Top of the Pops to Holes in Me Socks. I'm Martin Bell, and this is the Belsy Podcast. The Belsy Podcast. The Belsy Podcast. The Belsy Podcast. Welcome to episode three, where I meet up with my old friend, Golden Tonsils himself, Mr. Rick Astley. The Belsy Podcast. Got to talk to you about one of the greatest singers I've ever worked with, great songwriter as well. I was fortunate enough to work with him 20 odd years ago. And he's a lovely, lovely man and a very, very talented singer and songwriter. And he's just everywhere at the moment. And it's it's just so wonderful. And I'm so pleased when he joins me now. The wonderful Rick Astley. How are you, Rick? I'm all right. 20 odd years ago, Martin. That doesn't sound very good, though, does it? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, do you know what? If I, I thought it was about ten years ago, and then I start looking back, and you know, I think, yeah. wow, it was it was time flies. Time flies. I was I was actually just remembering back to yourself and myself going to Old Trafford actually when Teddy yeah. was playing up there, and um, yeah, we're not going to the game because it was a bad game for was, United, but uh, yeah, yeah, good yes. memories. That sort of leads me on to really your career in a way, because if you think about it. <sighs> Listen, I I knew that you was a good songwriter anyway. Even when Thank you. when we both wrote a couple of songs, I was so impressed mm. at how you how you sort of uh, you steamed straight into it. And then you know, and I'm just wondering, really, you probably did that, didn't you? You took a few years and said, I, I don't want to do maybe the the out and out pop tracks that you that you that you was doing before, which was great. And I know that you're proud of that, and we're all proud of that as well. But afterwards, you start writing songs yourself, and you've taken your time to come back with your career, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, I also think, to be honest, I got a bit disillusioned and I, I think I got sick of it and I'm pretty sure everyone got sick of me as well. And so there's a moment where you have to, there's a back door and there's a little exit sign on it and you think, I think I'm just going to nip out there while <laughs> everyone's looking at take that or whoever else. Yeah, yeah. Um, and just, just walk away calmly and, and quietly. And, um, you know, and I didn't, if I'm honest, I didn't actually think I was ever going to do it again, even gigging. You know, I didn't mm. gig for years. No. Um and um, I kind of fell back into gigging, to be honest, and that was because I had lots of offers to come and sing my old tunes in different parts of the world, and I just kind of said politely no. Um, and then I got an offer to go to Japan, and our daughter and my wife, Lena, as you know, you know, yeah. they, they, they really, really wanted to do that and go to Japan and experience that in a nice way, which is obviously the way you do it when you're on tour, you get looked after and everything. So yeah. I kind of, you know, they put my arm up my back and we went to Japan, <laughs> and I just loved it. And I think something, because it was so far away and I was a bit jet lagged and it's just such an amazing, completely different world to the one that I'm used to. I have been there a few times, but it's still, you know, it's totally different. It just, there was like a little light that just went on that said, you can do this, but you're allowed to say no to things. And I think going back those years when we first met and what have you, I was coming out of that period you know, emotionally and mentally of, yeah, of were, having yeah. been really famous, if you like, mm. yeah, no, you're and right, then yeah. not being famous and going, this is really nice. Mm. I've loved being famous. Don't get me wrong. I absolutely loved it and I'm mm. grateful for it. And I'll, I'll never look at it in a negative way because it did some amazing things for me and it has given me a great life. Yeah. But I think when you sort of step away from it and then people forget you pretty quickly, you suddenly think, well, I love music. How can I balance it? How can I go out and do gigs and even make a bit of music? Mm. And have a bit of spotlight when, when I want it and when, you know, yeah. but just be able to turn it off a bit. And I think that's where I am right now. I can I can do things. I can play to, you know, decent sized audiences. Mm. And then literally going for coffee this morning, no one bats an eyelid. And if someone <laughs> does, it's like, oh, hello. hello. You, you know, and that's it. <laughs> and that's, it, it's amazing. And, and I think... Yeah, I just I just think what happened with me was a bit a bit too much too soon, if you know what I mean. And yeah. I think it kind of um, so yeah, I was kind of glad to sign it, could kind of walk away a little bit, and I'm I'm just really really grateful and happy where I am right now. It's mm. kind of amazing to be honest after all but, these years. But I think it, it, well, yeah, listen, I know that that little period of time for you was you know that sort of in the middle where you didn't want that sort of limelight. But mm. you must be proud now that people are buying the songs that you're writing. Oh, I am, and I make them in the garage, Martin. That's yeah. the other funny thing. I kind of, I, I bought, you know, I bought gear over the years, and yeah. I had a proper studio at one point, and all the rest. Yeah, of well, it. I used and, to come that one. That was fantastic. Exactly, yeah. yeah but, yeah. Um, but you know, I just, you know, when we moved the last time, I thought I'm just going to put something together at home, and I converted the garage, and, and mm. you know, it's a nice garage. Don't get me wrong; yeah. it's all lovely, but <laughs> it is a garage. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's not and, a council estate, is it? <laughs> well, and I make records in there, and I kind of think. 
I think, bizarrely, it's like being a kid again. It's yeah. kind of like I've got a back bedroom studio and I do it all. Um, I have it mixed properly, obviously, and engineered properly because, you know, you've got to do that. But, mm. but in terms of me playing it, writing it, all of that, lot, I do it. And I, I absolutely love it. And then my records because of that. Yeah. And I think, especially with that first one when I turned 50, the one that was called 50, yeah. I just think in certain ways it just connected with people because there was a bit of empathy and a bit of kind of like good on you for having a go. So, do you know certainly. what I mean? So yeah. um, I don't know. You can never tell, can you? That's, that's the really weird thing. We, we've been around records and producer friends and people and, and seen things and you think there is no way on earth that is not going to be massive. Yeah. And it isn't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then you all go, how did that not happen? It's and then other times, totally. you, you hear this record that's like this quirky, what just bizarre record, number one all around the world, whatever, and there's just no rhyme or reason to it. So you've no. just got to kind of have fun with it and do what you want to do because you can't calculate it. You can't put it into a computer and, and come up with a hit. You you just have to do it and see what happens. So. Yeah. I mean, you, listen, your voice has always sold it as well. You know, I remember... Thank you. You, you know, us doing a, a vocal and you said, no, you do it. And I said, no, you do it. And you, you, do, you did the <laughs> vocal. And I went... Wow, it's just so warm and and rich Thank your you. voice, and it you know, and it and it is, and on a <laughs> strangely enough, I think I sent you a message. I, I was on my way to a gig, and I was a song come on. I thought, like this track, nice start, like the vocal, that's good. I'm going to shazam it, shazammed it, and your vo- your face come up, and I went, <laughs> oh, I can't believe it. And uh, it. you know, I just I look at that, and I think it, it's 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 wonderful that your voice can still sell it as well, because I think, do you think some of the the artists of today, we're it, it's just. I suppose with some of the shows, it's diluted good singers. Some of the talent yeah, shows, uh, yeah, to some degree. But I think I actually think we're. we're we, I do agree with you, by the way. I think yeah. I think there was definitely a whole whole swathe of time where having a good voice sort of didn't matter in pop yeah, music yes. because we've got loads of trickery to get away with it. Yeah. But I think right now, and I think for a few years, if you let's say Rag and Bone Man. Yeah, um, yeah, Sam Smith, Adele, obviously, some of the biggest, biggest artists in the world. Even um, y- y- you know Ed Sheeran, who who is you know we everyone knows him for being this great songwriter and and yeah. like he goes on stage with just a guitar. If you yeah. actually listen to him sing, he's an amazing singer. Yeah, and I think we're in a period where some of the biggest artists, and, and I think pretty much everyone just mentions from the UK right there, which is amazing as well. Oh, actually, yeah, you know, yeah. um, but some of the biggest artists in the world and. They're kind of slightly, um, I'm going to use the term old school, and I hope that's not offensive. What I mean by that is there's a real song there with someone singing the heart out. And I think sure. I think that's kind of interesting at the moment. Um, and, and someone like Adele or, or, or some of the other artists I just mentioned hmm. appeal to really young people and also your grandma. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's, I don't know, it's kind of, it, it, music is, has never been more, bizarre and upside down than it than it is today and obviously it's because of the internet it's, yeah. it's streaming services and all the rest of it and the way we all listen the way we come across new stuff the way we make our own playlists or someone a friend will just say oh listen to this yeah. there's 28 songs there you know you've never heard any of them before have a listen to all of them mm-hmm. it's it's kind of a different world and i think that has brought a whole new thinking um emotionally as well it's not just a head thing it's a heart thing yeah. as to how we absorb the music that we do and and very often i think you know i come across things just either on the radio as well sometimes as well for sure and i just sort of think wow i'm gonna love that artist forever that's yeah, just amazing yeah, do you know what i mean yeah. and it's we we did that by going to record stores and asking the guy, would he play it while we were in the shop? That's you know true. what I mean? That's Sometimes, which, yeah, is, yeah. which is prehistoric to think, you know what I mean? But, it, but it's, I don't know. I don't think people are ever going to change their love of music. It's just the way you listen to it. The other one that uh, I've got, we've got to ask you about is this, this great fixation with the Foo Fighters. I mean, that must be oh. great, because I know that you love your music. You're a great drummer, you're a good Thank musician, you. and you've sort of... You're jumping on their shows, aren't you? And they're doing never going to give you up. I mean, the, the, it, the first one, basically what happened was we, we um, uh, about three or four years ago, I think it was, it was like my third or fourth trip to Japan in the last sort of decade. And we, we got to play on this festival, which, which for starters was a bit nuts because Foo Fighters are headlining. So how is that possible? Yeah. But then when I looked at it, it was a really, really eclectic festival. There was all kinds of everything going on everywhere. And I've always been a bit of a Foo Fighters fan. Anyway, yeah, I, I, mean, I say bit of, I'm playing that down. I, I, I've always loved them, to be honest. But <laughs> and, I, and I have a little midlife crisis rock band that I play drums and singing, yes, and we yeah. do some of their songs, and we do a bit of Pistols and everything in between. Yeah. And 
so anyway, so, so we went right up to the side of the stage because obviously it was the second night and I thought, I'm never going to get to stand this close to the beat again. That's never going to... I can always buy a ticket, but I can't stand here. <laughs> but Dave Grohl saw me by the side of the stage and 20 minutes later, he's whispering in my ear in front of 50,000 people, we're doing your tune, no. but a bit like Smells Like Teen Spirit. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, Dave, great. <laughs> Great Dave in front of 50,000 Foo fans. Dave! And, um, and then I just, I won't say what I said now, obviously, because we're yeah, on the radio, yeah. but I screamed something at the audience. Not to be rock and roll, but just because I, I had it. a few beers by I then. Yeah, I was yeah. jet lagged to, to hear him back. I just looked at all those people. I looked around at the band who I, who I know, obviously, from all their music, but I've never, I literally never met them. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, I've got no idea what's going on or what's about to happen, but yeah. in for a penny, in for a pound. And it was just amazing. We had yeah. an absolute riot. And then, you know, the band, my band and I and crew and what we just watched the rest of the gig. And then they invited us backstage and we just hung out with them for a few hours. And it was just amazing. And yeah. I've done it with them a couple of times since. They've kind of, you know, got in touch and yeah. sent me a text and saying, you know, what are you doing tomorrow? What are you doing? <laughs> you yeah. <know>? So yeah, <laughs> I'm, been, I'm doing pretty, anything. Pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. And we, we went to California, actually. They've kind of reinvigorated a, a 70s festival again and kind of, taking it on board to kind of curate it and everything and um so we went to that like uh, last year i think it was or the year before yeah. and um that was pretty wild because i think when you're kind of you're in the same you're on the same festival that's one thing but to actually fly to la to do it it's a bit mad yeah. but it was just brilliant it was just really good oh, fun listen, and, it, listen. and it i think they're one of those bands that you've got to admire whether you like their music yeah, or you huge. don't because yeah. they've stood the test of time. They keep doing it. They're still playing. They're still rocking it. They're still headlining. They're still all those things. And you, you know, and I think if you are a fan, it's kind of a, it's a golden moment to go and see them really. So we're still with Rick Astley, the legend that is uh, Rick. I just, you know, listen, thanks for staying with us, but I just wanted to Pleasure. ask you, I, I know that in those days you said, you said to me, you didn't fancy doing many gigs then, but then you jumped out on the, they used to open up for Peter Kay, and then you had yeah. to take that to What was the Take That Tour like, by the way? The Take That thing was amazing, to be honest. I mean, it's possibly that I've, I've never, other than obviously with Peter Kay, I've never opened up for another band kind of thing. Yeah. And that's not out of snobbery or any kind no, of no, no. do it. It just never came along. Mm. And um, I, I think, yeah, it was the best possible <laughs> one we could have ever done. <laughs> um, the guys are great, obviously. They've got that catalogue of songs, and they keep writing new great songs. That they, They've got all that sorted. But it's, it's them and the people they work with, the band and the crew and everybody that they work with, they're an absolute delight to be on tour with. Because you hear all these horror stories sometimes yeah. of people, you know, getting the crappy dressing rooms and all the bar and all the rest of it and everything. But they were just amazing. They were really great. And so their audience as well are just bonkers. I mean, I've, I've seen <laughs> take that over the years since when they started, been to different tours that they've done. Their audience are just full on bonkers, and that's scary, <laughs> but also amazing because it's scary because you're the opening act, and do they care? Yeah. But I think we just we just won on all so many different levels because they were so ready to see those guys that they got in the room early, so we played pretty much to full houses, which was just nuts because they just did, yeah. you know, a week of arenas everywhere or more, and and then football stadiums. So, and I've never done that. I've never done football stadiums. You know what I mean? Right. It's just. Just crazy. Yeah. So it was a it was a really amazing tour to do, to be honest, and, and yeah, well, something I don't think we'll ever forget, really. What about this new album that out, the, the best of me at the moment? What? To, to, to yeah, well, it was that. just one of those things where I made two records previous to that, where I've you know, as we talked about before, where I've done them in the garage and done all of that, and the label that I'm I'm with today is the label I used to be back in the day, and they've just looked at it all and said, look, you should do a best of at some point in your life because you've got new songs now that that your actual fans. Mm are happy to have in that collection. And, and one of my replies to that, to be honest, because of the internet thing was, well, yeah, but it's already up there. <laughs> it's already... Yes, it's still so, there, yeah, yeah. And again, being on the take, that's always kind of interesting because they have kind of reimagined and re-sort re, re of looked at a lot of their old really big hits and stuff and kind of redone them a little bit, you know what I mean? And, yeah. and watching their audience and just listening to those tunes in a different way and stuff. Um, and other bands have done it as well, I guess. You know, it just makes you think. So that's kind of what we did. We re-recorded ten or eleven of the songs. So the old ones are all there, obviously, but then there's two, or ten or eleven new versions and a new tune. And it was just a nice thing to do. And it's kind of weird to take a song like "Never Gonna Give You Up," which is 32 years old, I think now, or whatever wow. it is, and completely redo it just just with a piano and a bit of this. And you know what I mean? And yeah. and when we've we've played that live just to a small audience it's just some sort of warm warm up style gigs for that album if you like mm. um it, it's just so weird because people sit and listen to me sing it now rather than singing along with yep. word one do yep. you know what i mean yep. and, and, that, and don't get me wrong 
I'm unbelievably grateful for that song and the fact that people do sing along with me and I don't ever want that to stop. Yeah. But it's just been amazing to do like a slow ballad version of it and hear the words come out of my mouth differently. Yeah, yeah. It's just, I can't explain it to be honest. You no. know what that's like. You've been singing certain yeah. favourites of yours for years. Yeah. And it's weird if you... It, it's different it's... singing Sven, 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 though, no, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> I can't make it too soulful, you know. It's right. golden balls I can get away with, but spend, spend, spend. I can't get away with. Oh, it. genius, genius. What, what's next? What, what's coming up? We're going to do the Albert Hall again this time, wow. which is wow. just. I mean, you know, I've sung there at certain charity things over the years and stuff, but it's just an amazing venue. I think it's one of those. Yeah. I don't know. I, I sang there at the Prince's Trusts and, and also at the, the, the what used to be the, the Brits. It was called something else back then. But yeah. And that was back in like 87 and 88. And I was thinking like, how literally, literally, how did I get here? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it was one of those kind yeah. of things. And every time I walk in that room, I still feel the same. So, yeah. so might, might, have to come, might have to come at that one. In fact, we should both say happy birthday to our, uh, our mutual producer, Gary Stevenson. This is his birthday today, who, who introduced us. Both. Absolutely, it is. And Absolutely, I'm, yeah. I know he's... No, uh... Listen, I mean, I've, I, I, I do speak to Gary at times and what have we text a bit and stuff, but yeah, I need to give him a call today. But um, happy birthday. Yeah, well, no. Do you know what? Do you know what? There, there, was a, there was an old a great story that we... Uh, <laughs> We was at Gary Stevenson's studio up in Oxford, in I know there, and we we were going out to dinner, and I went to sit in the front of the car, and he got in the other side, and you went to get in the back, and Gary said to me, what are you doing? And I said, what? And he said, no, no, no. He said, you have to sit in the back. Only people who have had hit records can sit in the front. <laughs> <laughs> and it was it was about ten oh, years. Gary. It was Gary. And about ten years later, I went up there and I said, "Am I all right sitting in the front?" He said, "What do you mean?" I said, "Well, you told me ten years ago." He said, I said "He said, oh, you've had a hit record now. You can sit in the front." <laughs> yeah, you've had a hit. Now you're allowed in the front. No, he's a he's a funny bloke, Gary. I mean, I've got so many great memories of even going back to the Isle of Man days when he had a studio there. And yeah, I learned a lot from Gary. I think because obviously he was a very very different style of producer to like the, the Stock Aitken Walkman guys, and that's like, all I knew in terms of making records. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, I learned a lot, really, and he's made some great records well, over I know, the years, and I kind of, yeah. I know one of the singles that he did do with you, which I want to try and get Mark, our producer, to play out, which is, well, I still love it. It was Cry For Help, your big hit in America as well, and I just, you know, it's just such a wonderful song and a wonderful vocal song. We're going to try and play that at some point uh, throughout the show. Listen, Rick, I really appreciate you coming on. And, uh, we need to get out for a beer, Martin. Oh, That's what we need. Listen, to do. let's 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 arrange it. We'll get Brad and a few of the few of our old gang, and we're yeah, uh, we're going to have a, we're going to have a beer. Love to the family. Love to Lena, Amelia, and everybody. And just thank you, Martin. Listen, and you lot. stick in, stay in touch, and uh, we look forward to the Albert All. By the way, no worries. I'll text you when you're off air, love. Wonderful, you wonderful. Rick Astley, everybody. Contact us at thebelzypodcast at gmail.com. Remember, Belzy, B-E-L-S-Y. The Belzy Podcast is an M-L-E-M production.